Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. My name is Craig Kalki, team leader of the Cooperative Extension Lake Ontario Fruit Program. Welcome to our continuation of our webinar series that we're turning into a spring webinar series. This is our spring bloom meeting. So we're going to start out with a presentation by Dr. Terrence Robinson from Cornell. I know a lot of you have been following along and the fruit faxes and our email blasts and our fruit notes about the situation with some frost damage and how to go about making decisions on bloom thinning and beyond. This meeting is sponsored by OSCO Inc. We thank Andy DeLude and company for their support. Uh, they want to remind you, they want to thank you for their support and let you know that they're here for parts, sales, and surface in these difficult times. You can reach them at that 1-800 number on the screen, find out more information on the pro about their products on their website there below. And there's also a direct number, 413-369-4335, that I will put in the chat box. And they're available from Monday to Friday from 7 to 5. With that, I will turn it over to Terrence. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an exciting time of year and I'm very, very enthused to talk about uh, blossom thinning at this meeting. I first start with a small review of just the steps in precision chemical thinning. And it really begins with the blossom thinning spray guided by the pollen tube growth model. And this particular meeting date is ideal because we're just right now in the middle or starting this blossom thinning uh, period and we'll talk about the specifics of the model and how this might lead to sprays within the next uh, two to three days maybe sooner <clears throat> and that then needs to be followed up with a, probably a second blossom thinning spray and I'm going to go through how to do that in quite detail for this meeting not too far distant based upon weather forecast, we will be at petal fall. I'm going to show a slide later with a carbon balance model that's predicting that we will be at the petal fall thinning spray by Wednesday of next week because it's going to happen very quickly because of warm temperatures. <clears throat> but I do want to emphasize that I think that in most cases um, with Honeycrisp, Fuji, Gala, where there was little frost damage, we need to blossom thin and we need to petal fall thin. Then we need to assess where we are using the fruit growth rate model. I'm hoping that there will be many of you who are participating in this video conference call today that will be willing to measure fruit growth rate and send me the data that I can look at it and get a feel for what's happening. I will give you specific recommendations for your farm, your block, individually, but I also use the data that you send me as a way to try to keep a handle and a pulse on what's happening industry-wide, uh, kind of by county and how far from the lake. And that information we then use in the fruit facts and the fruit newsletter to guide many growers. <clears throat> if after the petal fall spray, we measure fruits and we still have too many fruits, we will then come in around 12, 13 millimeters with a normal main thinning spray. And if that works well, we will stop. If it doesn't, we still have one additional option at 20, 18 to 20 millimeters to spray one more time to try to get down to the target fruit number. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, 2020 has been a very challenging year. So blossom thinning has been in our plan ever since we had a light bloom last year of Honeycrisp and we now have a heavy bloom. But the decision on whether to blossom thin is complicated by the repeated frost that we've had and the very early green tip and the very long protected period. Um, it's not such an easy decision this year. I tell you that in the Hudson Valley, because of the level of frost damage and the widespread nature of it, I ended up telling people not to blossom thin. However, in Western New York, I still believe there's room in many blocks to blossom thin. I want to show the data that the Lake Ontario fruit team collected, and I really appreciate our team, and they are a great team, for collecting this data in different counties that helps me get a sense of what's going on. <clears throat> You'll see for Niagara and Orleans and Wayne counties, <clears throat> there's damage in many blocks. But interestingly enough, the damage varies considerably. <clears throat> in the darker bar on the left, 
we have the damage to king flowers in a particular block, and there's four of them from Niagara County. Some blocks have more than 70% damage to kings. Other blocks have maybe 40 or less. In general, though, Niagara County has more damage than Wayne County. Likewise, in Orleans, there were five blocks we evaluated, and one had damage levels to kings, and this is just with Honeycrisp, more than 70% but there was one who had only 5%. And when you look at Wayne County in general, no blocks had that really high level of damage of 70 or 80%, but there was a couple of blocks out of the six that had, um, or seven that had uh, around 40% damage, and some had essentially none. If we look at the other varieties I'm really interested to blossom thin, Gala, I expected to have less damage, but in Niagara County, there's some blocks that, you know, 80 to 90% of the kings are damaged. With Gala, it's really interesting to look at the laterals as well. Generally, the laterals came through better, 30% damage or less. In Orleans County, the damage to Gala seems substantially less, at least at the smattering of blocks that we looked at. In Wayne County, it's really, really variable. Some gala blocks have 50% damage to kings and some have none. <clears throat> the third variety I'm really interested to blossom thin is Fuji. Here, the damage I think is generally highest. And it's, you know, still the same story of being quite variable, but you see quite a bit of damage in some blocks in Wayne County. Interestingly, we couldn't associate any of this with nearness to Lake Ontario. Some blocks that are south of 104 seem to have less damage than those that are right up along the lake. It seemed to me to be more associated with the specific site characteristics of the location. For example, in Wayne County up on Drumlins on hills, we tended to have less damage and right down on flat ground close to the lake. This all leads us to this problem that um, to decide whether to blossom thin, you have to know what level of damage you had. But I will emphasize this point. It's essential for return bloom of Honeycrisp and Fuji. So we need to learn how to blossom thin to control biannual bearing. <clears throat> Without it, we will be next year kicking ourselves that we didn't have the nerve this year to blossom thin. Now I'm gonna say this several times in my presentation. I just have an arbitrary cutoff point. In my mind, if your block has more than 40% of the kings damaged, you probably shouldn't blossom thin. In essence, the frost has already done some thinning for you. However, if your block on any of the three varieties we wanna blossom thin, Honeycrisp, Fuji, or Gala, has less than 40% damage, I think you should blossom thin because the blossom thinning will give us repeat bloom. And here's some data from one of our trials at Geneva with Honeycrisp. And if you look at the bottom yellow bar, the unthinned control had return bloom of about 10%. That's not enough for a full crop. Just a single ATS spray, in this case two gallons, resulted in close to 50% return bloom. If we did the traditional NA at petal fall, or yeah, we got a little better return bloom, but it wasn't the big boost we were looking for. The big boost came when we combined ATS with later applications of Maxellan 7 or even NAA in 7, where with the Maxellan 7, we were up at 75% return bloom. <clears throat> but my point is that the ATS was a big part of that repeat bloom. Hence, I really want to encourage those of you listening Maybe you're the, the trailblazers because not everybody's joining us on this conference call, but I appreciate those that did, that we'll be able to accurately evaluate the damage level in your block and where you don't have too much damage to go forward with blossom thinning. <clears throat> I present next just a review of the options of chemicals at different timings. I wanna focus for this presentation primarily on the bloom thinning Ammonium thiosulfate is the only of the two caustics that is legal. Now it's not technically legal as a thinner, it's legal as a foliar nitrogen fertilizer because it is ammonium, that's nitrogen. 
So in your spray records, you have to list that you're spraying this chemical for the purpose of foliar nitrogen fertilizer at a rate of two and a half gallons per hundred. If you time this application with a pollen tube growth model as a side effect, you get blossom thinning, which is what we want. Now lime sulfur and oil is in fact a more effective spray combination but we have not been able to convince any of the lime sulfur producers to label it in New York. They labeled it in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Those state regulatory agencies are easier to deal with than our state regulatory agencies. So we haven't been able to get it labeled in New York. Um, so I can't recommend it. <clears throat> there are several hormone type thinners. Chromalin in some years has a little thinning effect, Maxell, NAA is the one that works the best on return bloom for Honeycrisp at four ounces per hundred gallons. And amethyst is also registered newly for blossom thinning and regalia, which is a plant extract that is useful in organic production. Our test results with regalia have been quite disappointing. We haven't got the thinning that I had hoped. So let me present it in a simplified form. I prefer that you would spray ammonium thiosulfate. If you think that is too risky, a second option would be to spray NAA at 10 parts per million. The NAA option is very safe. NAA at this timing has essentially almost no thinning action, but it does help stimulate return bloom. So those are the two options that I would suggest based upon the damage level in your block and how worried you are that you might not have fruit set. Just one comment about the petal fall spray, which will come up maybe before our next meeting. I'd like to wait till fruits are a little bigger than they are right at petal fall, five to six millimeters. And I'll talk more about how to determine that in a few minutes. But the best options are NA and seven. Seven alone might be an option this year where you've had significant damage to both kings and laterals. But I think almost every block, except where damage is above 75%, should get at least seven at petal fall, and probably NA and seven would be better. Maxell and sevens worked well if the temperatures are warm. Now this might be the year for Maxell and seven. In years with cold temperatures, it does almost nothing. Now amethyst is also registered at petal fall and is a very safe and mild thinner and could be a substitute for NA and seven. We'll have another meeting before the 10 millimeter timing to talk more about what to do there. So I'm going to go forward <clears throat> just to talk. Lawrence, can I in interrupt you for a second? Yeah. You got a question related to this. Mm -hmm. This is from Rod. Any experience with ethyl plus NAA used extensively in New Zealand for two sprays during bloom? Yeah, we have not done very much of that. I tried ethyl a little bit, but not mixing it with NAA. Now, uh, my experience with ethyl, which is a really in Australia and New Zealand, even it before bloom, some at pink and some at bloom, is relatively common. I have been shy of it here because of my bad experiences with ethyl if we get hot temperatures and we have humid conditions. It's an ethylene producer, and anytime you mix ethylene with temperatures in the high 70s, above 75 or 80 or 85, you knock all the fruit off. And it has seemed to me to be quite dangerous. Now, in New Zealand, in particular, with a maritime climate, I don't think they typically have that risk. But with good forecasts, it might be a, a possible option. I'm unwilling to recommend it. Another question. Uh, Max L, you said it doesn't work when it's cold. Can you kind of define cold, cold temperature range where it does not work as well? It doesn't work very well below 70. If you get 70 or 72, 74, 75, it works beautiful. But in the low 60s, it doesn't work very well at all. Thank you, Terrence. And this one is probably for you and Mario. We've been doing a lot of these, but explain the best way to determine damage on bloom. So all the evaluations that we did, we did it with a razor. So we just, we, we just didn't cut the flower and see just the upper, part of the of the flower because sometimes uh, the flower looks healthy at the top but if you continue uh, slicing the flower or if you go 
and you remove everything with the razor in the cavity. And sometimes you at the bottom, you see some browning uh, in the vascular connection. That is telling us that perhaps you're gonna have pollination, that flower is gonna stay there, it's gonna look healthy, it's gonna set fruit, and that fruit is gonna start growing two, three, four millimeters, but in some moment it's gonna collapse because that connection, the vascular connection, is compromised. So that is, is a is a is a is a fruitlet or it's a flower that today, if you evaluate that way, it's not gonna work out. And those are the percentages that we are showing in those graphics. Thank you, Mario. Another add-on from me would be that we realize that there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, there's some efficient ways that we've done having to test these multiple blocks across our whole region. So we plan to come out with, at least for next year, a little mini video of how you would collect at the different stages, the clusters, the quickest way to evaluate them. I do them with, a, I bring them back to my kitchen table or a, a, a bench and I get a bright light and I put my readers on because it's a lot easier to see if the vascular tissue is turning brown or black, uh, kind of with a little bit of magnification there and a data table next to it. And it's, it becomes pretty efficient to be able to evaluate a large amount of clusters from different blocks. So we plan on that, having that as an educational tool for next year, realizing that um, there's, out there, but it's not completely clear. So, so one one important thing, and Terrence, here you can bring the math behind. Uh, when 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 you evaluate at least fifty clusters, fifty fruitlets, uh, fifty clusters, one keen and five or four laterals. Uh, if you find one keen or two keen compromise with damage of the fifty uh, cluster that you randomly selected you're gonna have right away there a 10, 20% damage, 20%, 19%. So don't go there with just five or 10 or 15 cluster. I see so Terrence was telling us that he at least wanted to have evaluated at least 50 uh, of these clusters to get to come up with good number for those graphics. Let me add just a couple of points to that question. If the damage happened quite early, and we've had multiple frosts. The earlier damage, which would have been late March, early April, often is expressed in the lower part of the bud where it connects to the vascular tissue. And you don't see that if you just look at the top of the flower, you just go out and look, all well, the pistils look good. Later damage, after the flowers are centrally opening and you pass tight cluster to pink, that's when the tips of the pistils get damaged. And you can often see that damage just looking at the flower from the top. That's why we recommend that you actually cut the flowers all the way down so you can see the base of the flower, um, the pistil itself, and you can get an assessment of whether the damage happened early or late and add it all together. If you really want to have a good uh, assessment of your block, you need to cut 50 flower, king flowers and 50 lateral flowers so that um, you can get a real sense and calculate a percentage. Now there's some statistics behind that that I won't explain right now, but I'd love to have an actual numeric assessment of each block so that you can then kind of use my uh, arbitrary numbers of less than 40% or more than 40% damage with the uh, king blooms uh, as determining whether or not you go forward with a uh, blossom thinning. Any more questions about damage assessment? There was one more. Do you cut vertically through the style? I cut down vertically through the flower, but it doesn't have to go straight through the style. It's not that exact. When you get further down below the style into the flower, I want to be cutting through the tissue. Okay, let me go on to talk about my thoughts for blossom thinning. If you have this less than 40% damage and you decide to blossom thin, I think we're at the perfect stage today to talk about it and get ready for thinning tomorrow or the next day. <clears throat> it begins by measuring style length. Usually those style length should be between eight and 12 millimeters. When we first started using this model, we made the mistake of trying to peel away too much of the sepal tissue and measuring right to the base. 
but that's not the way the model was developed. So the model was developed by just removing the petals from the flower, but not the sepals. Now the sepals are the green part. And then just measuring from the top of where the sepals fold down to the tip of the style and measure it in millimeters and measure enough flowers so that you can get an average. Generally 20 flowers is enough. Now I would love you to measure king flower uh, style length, not laterals, because we're really focusing on king flowers for this project or this effort. Secondly, after you have that style length, you go into the pollen tube growth model, which is on NUA, thanks to Greg Peck for getting that going. And then you plug in your block data and you tell it when to start the clock. Now, when to start the clock is determined by when flowers open. So we were trying to check over the last few days um, when enough king flowers open to have the number of flowers of our target fruit number. So let's just say for discussion that we have some tall spindle trees and our target is 100 fruits. When 100 king flowers open, that's when we start the clock. And it's very simple to do with the new model, the pollen tube growth model. And once you start the clock, then it is calculates degree hours as you move forward, plus it predicts based on forecasts, and it'll tell you when you can expect to be at the critical moment to spray. And I'll show a picture next with that output for Geneva. Just a comment or two about the beginning of the clock. This year it's complicated because of the damage. Let's suppose you have less than the 40% damage, but you have 20% damage. You still decide you're gonna blossom thin with ATS. There's two options. One is to, if you want 100 fruits, let 120 flowers open before you start the clock. Or let's say 150 flowers open before you start the clock. Another option is to spray ATS a few hours later than we normally would. Now that brings me to the point of ATS and when to spray it in relation to the model. ATS is a less effective chemical at blossom thinning than is lime sulfur and oil. Lime sulfur and oil is what the model was based on. It works well when you spray when the model reaches 100% because that chemical basically kills all the way down the style pollen tubes that haven't reached the ovule yet. But ATS isn't that good. It burns the tip of the style and not that far down. So as a, wor as a workaround, we decided a couple years ago, and last year we tested it more, to start spraying at 60% on the model, which is not what the model instructions say. But it's worked well for us, and we again recommend that for this year. Once you spray your first spray, you plug that into the model, and then it restarts it, and you would then apply a second spray when it reaches 60%. The second spray is aimed at knocking out the flowers that hadn't quite opened when you put your first spray on. Now this year, with the warm temperatures, everything might be open when the first spray goes on, and the second spray might not even be needed, but generally, those blooms on one year wood on Gala aren't open yet, and so that second spray catches most of them. So I already mentioned this second and big bulleted point that if some kings are damaged, you what do you do? Uh, you let more flowers open before starting the clock. What do you do though if you have more than 40% damage to kings? Then an NAA spray is very useful to stimulate return bloom, but it's also very safe it really won't knock out any of the kings that are still good. So that's what I would suggest, where you have damage that's 40%, 50%, 60%. I'm gonna say it a little later, if your total damage is over 75%, I don't think you spray anything. I think at that point, the frost has done your complete thinning job. But if you got less damage, I think an NAA spray, and this one's timed a little different, it's at full bloom. Now, full bloom is technically defined in horticulture textbooks when 80% of all flowers are open on the north side of the tree. Now, with tall spindle and super spindle, and the north versus south side is not that big a deal anymore. But basically, when four out of five flowers all on one side of the tree are open, that we call full bloom. And that's the proper timing for an NAA spray if you choose not to use the ATS spray and use the pollen tube growth model. Now, this Both is related a, questions. Uh, Terrence, yes. can you tank mix calcium and NAA at bloom? Looking at Honeycrisp? Yes, uh, NAA is compatible with calcium. There'll be no problem with that. 
Assuming the calcium is a safe product and won't damage the surface of those little fruitlets. Thank you. One more question. This year, uh, the tops are about a day behind the blue bottoms. Do we need to wait for adequate flowers to open in the tops? Um, I would wait, but generally, uh, we can't thin the tops even with this pollen tube growth model as well as I would like. So I would wait for a few extra flowers to open, but not wait too long. If you wait too long, you essentially get no thinning out of ATS. Thank you. And I just to let folks know in the chat box, I put a link of a webinar that was recorded by Mike Bastow in Eastern New York, reviewing the pollen tube growth model with Dr. Greg Peck and Dan Olmsted, Olmsted from Cornell Adria Tech with Geneva. I ran the pollen tube growth model just an hour before this meeting for the Geneva site. Now Geneva, I put time zero when enough flowers are open yesterday at 6 p.m. in the evening. Now that was for Honeycrisp and for Gala, probably I put, I put 9 p.m. They happen very, very close to each other. This morning by midday, we already have three or 400 flowers open. It's happened fast. But the pollen tube growth model starting at yesterday at 6 p.m. has us right now at 11 a.m. when I ran this at 17% of the distance down the style that pollen tubes would have grown. It also projects forward that on tomorrow afternoon, about 1 p.m., we would in theory get to 60%. So that kind of gives me a way to time and to plan my work here at Geneva. So for Honeycrisp, I'm probably gonna spray ATS tomorrow at one o'clock. We're actually doing a study where we're spraying earlier, we're gonna spray at 10 a.m., at 1 a.m. and 6 p.m. or something like that. So we can look at how critical this timing is and see if we can detect differences in the ultimate uh, thinning efficacy. But for a grower, you would then need to make that decision when you think you had enough flowers open on Honeycrisp, or if you're working with Fuji, or if you're working with Gala for each variety differently, and then start the clock. The temperatures we have forecasted for today, tomorrow, the next day are gonna make this move fast. It's not even uh, 48 hours, it's you know 36 hours between when we started the clock and when we're gonna spray. So I wanna stop here and see if there's any questions or comments about starting the clock and using the model. I would like to just call on Rod to tell us what he's going to do because he's been corresponding with me and I already know what he's going to do. And I think he's got great ideas. So yeah, basically, you know, agree with most everything Terrence has said, and we had great success last year with Gala. We didn't spray Honeycrisp, unfortunately. Great success with Gala spraying at the 60%. So wanted to do it again this year, but we've got blocks with damage ranging anywhere from 10 to 35%. So my thought process had been, and I'm not sure if it's the right one, was to look at when I had the correct amount of, of blossom open and then change my percentage number to the same percentage of damage to make it an easy calculation. So that if I, if I needed 100, 100 open, that would be when I started my clock. And if I had 20% damage, but I wanted to spray at 60%, I'd still, I'd wait until 72% on the model. So an adjustment of 20%, whether that's gonna to be too much or not, I don't know. As, as Terrence says, when you get much beyond 60%, you get to zero effect pretty quickly. And yeah, when we wait to 100%, we don't get anything out of it. Yeah, it's, it's not good at all. In fact, it's the reverse because you might get a little bit, but then it makes everything else harder to thin. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I, Terrence's idea of actually going to the right number of live flowers, so maybe if you had 20% damage, instead of getting to 100, count 120 open and then start the clock and, and spray at 60 may be the wiser, the wiser route. It's going to move so fast, the difference between 60 and 70, those few hours could be a big difference. It may only be a couple of hours, but that's a lot of pollination. So that leads me to the, one of the issues with this whole pollen tube growth model is it's very time sensitive and growers ask me, hey, I've got 10 blocks or I can't do it all in one hour. 
And that is a real challenge. And it's just not possible to do all your farm with this. Now, talking to some growers in Washington, what they end up doing is they prioritize really difficult blocks where biennial bearing is a big deal, like Honeycrisp and Fuji. They're going to try to time pretty exactly. Other blocks, um, they just get to them when they can, knowing that they aren't there on the exact moment they should. And I guess that's what I would suggest for you. Um, I hope that people will try it. I hope that you'll set your clock back. If you, if you missed really looking yesterday, or perhaps your blocks are just getting there today, there's still time. You can make your best guess about when it might have been. Just do your best and the timing will, will probably work out just fine. <clears throat> Questions, folks, where we're at right now? Uh, I see one here, Terrence. Even if you're late, aren't you going to take the later side of bloom? If you're late, what happens is you get many more kings fertilized and some of the first laterals fertilized. You do still take off some of the laterals and then you would come back with a second spray and take off the others. But what happens is that if you don't get all of the extra kings off, they're sometimes later really hard to take off. You can't knock them off or nothing. And so the post bloom thinners have difficulty taking off those kings that set. Now that's the real beauty of this blossom thinning strategy if you got it perfect. Now maybe it's never gonna be done perfect, but the closer you can be to the proper timing, the less likely you are to have this myriad of extra kings fertilized. Now I just have to confess one thing. We tried like crazy to precision prune our honey crisp, but I made counts today and they're just more flowers. Everything is floral on Honeycrisp and Gala this year. So I've got a lot more kings than I should. If I let those kings get fertilized, then I'm gonna struggle to get them thinned post bloom. And when the kings are there too long, I get biennial bearing. So I tried to do it perfect in Geneva, but even there it's not been perfect because I've got too many flowers on both Gale and on Honeycrisp. Another question, Terrence. What is the base temperature they're using for the degree day model, for the pollen tube growth model? I can't remember that at the moment. I think it's 40. Probably on the website of the link. Thank you. I remember the degree day model we're using in the carbohydrate model slightly lower than many others. It's four degrees C, which is 38 degrees. So let me just make a couple of comments about post bloom thinning. Um, let's assume you go forward with this uh, blossom thinning and you get it timed pretty well and we knock off a lot of extra kings and then we come back with a second spray and knock off a lot of the extra laterals. And then we'll be in really good shape. But we still probably need some post bloom thinning. And we really are excited and positive about using the carbohydrate model to avoid over thinning. I announced last year a new version, it's called the 2019 version on NUA, but also there's the phone app version called Malusim. You can download it from either the app, app store of Android or the app store of, of, of Macintosh. Um, <clears throat> what we hope is that if we get into deficits that are serious, we can be protected from spraying, which will cause over thinning. Generally, I don't want to spray when carbon deficits are less than minus 50. And when you look at the new version of the model, it'll have a red box around a day with that kind of deficit. Another cool thing is that the model has this degree day calculator based on a base temperature of 38. And we found in this 18 year study we did that Generally, petal fall sprays occur when degree days are between 100 and 125 for good thinning at petal fall. And let me just comment about that. I should have put this as the first bullet point. But when we thin, as soon as you can blow the petals off, it's generally around 60 degree days, and we get almost no thinning. If we wait one, two, three days beyond that, then we get some pretty decent thinning from a petal fall spray. And that generally is when fruits are five to six millimeters. At pedophile, they're generally four, a true pedophile. 
So we're calling it the pedal fall thinner spray and we're trying to time it with this degree day calculator in the model. The best thinning occurs around the 12 millimeter, which is generally 200 to 250 degree days. And we'd like to use a model to time that spray if we need that spray this year. And then lastly, there's this very large fruit size, 16 to 18 millimeter timing. That's generally between 300 and 350 degree days. And it's a way for you to have basically 100 degree days between each of the three sprays. I ran the carbohydrate model for Geneva just an hour, or two hours ago now. And I wanted to just comment briefly on what we've seen. In the top is the chart. It shows that we had an extremely early green tip and then a very long, long protracted developmental period to get to full bloom, which I'm calling today, late today. You can see that we had uh, a significant deficit during that darker, cloudy, rainier period in early, late April, early May up to May 4th. We had a slight positive set of values from about May 7th to May 10th. But then we've been going in a deficit since then. If we look down at the numbers that come from the actual daily date below on this chart, on the 21st today, we're predicted to be 71, low of 44, but bright sunshine of 24 megajoules. Just to refresh your memory, the megajoule scale goes from zero to 30. Above 20 is a bright day in New York. Between 15 and 20 is sort of hazy. Below 15 is a dark day. <clears throat> Well, that combination of temperatures and sunlight is giving us a very mild deficit today. But since we predicted over the next several days to get warmer and have slightly less sunshine, the deficits will go up on a daily basis. It also shows that this average in the next to the last column is really affected by these really negative deficits that are forecasted for Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and deficits will be quite low. <clears throat> well, how does that impact us with the Pelafall spray? Well, over here you see the degree day accumulations in the last column. It's essentially nothing today, 10, but then it goes up rapidly, and we will be in the 100 to 150 window starting on the Wednesday the 27th. So bloom is going to go by really fast. And we will be ready for a petal fall spray starting Wednesday or Thursday. I don't know what the deficits will be then, but if they are moderate deficits of minus 40, that will be fantastic because we'll get great thinning out of a petal fall spray. And that would probably be all we would do, a blossom and a petal fall spray, and we'd be done. And that would result in excellent fruit size. But the model won't calculate that far out, so you just have to keep running it every day and see what the predicted deficits are gonna be as you think about getting ready to put on a petal fall spray next Wednesday or next Thursday. We might have another little chat before then. It depends on whether Craig and Mario are up to it. I'm always up to it, and I don't know if you guys are interested, but if you are, we could talk maybe on Wednesday about what we're seeing and what kind of a risk there is in petal fall thinning. Now, once we get that petal fall spray on, I need some of you to volunteer to measure fruits for us three days after the petal fall spray and then eight days after the petal fall spray so that we can calculate fruit growth rates and determine how many fruits are going to fall off. It may be that we're going to get all of our thinning done with the, both the bloom and petal fall spray and we'll be done. I'd sure like to know that with hard data. So I invite you to take data on your own with the, pollen, or the fruit growth rate model and send it to me. If you do send it to me, I'll turn it around in 24 hours and give you a recommendation, personal recommendation back. But it also helps me to guide the entire industry with what we say in the fruit facts. So let me end with this slide just as a summary. And I have two cautions at the very bottom I wanna make sure I say. This year with the damage, it's critical to assess each block, each variety in a systematic mathematical way. Cut 50 king flowers, cut 50 lateral flowers and calculate percentages. I'm most interested right now in the king flower damage. And so this statement, I highlight the box less. If king damage is less than 40%, then I think you should blossom thin. And I'm most interested to blossom thin Honeycrisp, Fuji and Gala with ATS. If you've got more than 40% damage, 
Then I think you should just wait and try to do this with petal fall and post bloom thinning. Now, if king flower damage is greater than 40%, don't blossom thin. Wait until petal fall to thin. Now, lastly, if you've got a lot of damage and the total damage between kings and laterals is greater than 75%, I don't think you should thin at all. Just wait and let's see what sets. And maybe you're just going to adjust a little bit with hand thinning. But the frost has already done thinning for you if that's the level of damage you have. Were you chemically thin after bloom, I would encourage you to use the precision thinning program. Apply a petal fall spray somewhere between 100 and 125 degree days. Then assess response by measuring fruitless diameter. And then if necessary, because this year it may not be necessary, apply a normal thinning spray at the 12 millimeter between 200 and 250 degree days. Reassess response with the fruit growth rate model measuring fruit diameters. And probably no one will need uh, this rescue spray at 18 to 20 millimeter at 300 and 350 degree days. But we'll see how the season develops. I will add that among the chemicals that you could use at that large fruit size diameter, 18 millimeters, we've tried ethyl, we've tried ethyl oil, we've tried NA7. The only thing that's worked consistently for us is Maxell 7 and oil at 100 parts per million at that large fruit diameter. Now, there are two new chemicals that we're researching, Metametron and ACC. Neither one is labeled this year, but I'm excited about them because they both have very significant thinning potential at large fruit size when we need them. Now, the two cautions are these. Uh, generally, frost damage is greater in the bottom of the tree and less in the top. That's the case where we have radiation frost. This year, the frost was the whole air moved in, and there may not be big differences. But nevertheless, where you've got significant frost damage, I don't think we need to apply any thinners to the bottom. Now, to, to help your confidence in this, we've done about four different years of studies where we look at the pattern of spray distribution. And one of our treatments is shut off the nozzles for all, bottom nozzles for all the sprays. And it turns out that's often in every trial we've run where we get the most uniform fruit distribution. So essentially the bottoms don't need thinners. Now that's for almost all trees, maybe a really two dimensional tree that might not apply. But I still think this year with frost damage, just turn off the bottom nozzles, the bottom third of the bank. And then number four, on a year like this, where we've had significant repeated frost, I think surfactants are like playing with dynamite. Where you have damage to leaf surfaces, or you have some potential damage to fruits, either regulate or oil will dramatically increase the amount of thinner taken into the plant and will dramatically increase the thinning response. Now, I've recommended against regulate an oil generally for many years, but there are some growers who like it and they routinely use regulate with their thinning sprays. I just think this year it's gambling too much and would hope that you would leave the regulate out. And don't put on the two pints of seven, just the one pint of seven, and don't have extra seven sitting out on the leaf waiting to be re-wetted and maybe get more thinning than we want if you've got damage and some of the fruits are weak. So with that sort of long-winded uh, presentation, I, I'd like to just engage in a discussion for the next however long anybody wants to talk about uh, blossom thinning in particular and, and cautions as we move forward. A couple quick questions, Terrence. Can you do some work to see if five days at 80 versus nine days at 60, for example, is correct for the second measurement? Oh, okay. yeah, we've done that kind of work and I should have maybe explained that. It depends completely on the temperatures between the two measurements. And when we have cold temperatures like we did last year, it really takes like, eight days between the third day measurement and 11th day measurement to get a good assessment. But I haven't really pushed that because people need to make a decision whether they reapply. On warm years, just measuring on day three and day seven with a four day interval is enough to assess the response. I don't know exactly what time temperatures we'll get when we're in that period. Up until petal fall, it looks pretty warm. But I probably should put that out in a more formal recommendation. 
what I want to do is start using degree days and, and, ma and match it to degree days that we measure a certain number of degree days after the application and we remeasure a certain degree days beyond that. And that would be the most consistent. But for now, measure on day three and on day eight is sort of a compromise. If it's really cool, stretch it out to day 10 for the second measurement. I hope you guys can be trailblazers and we can get all of you to do some blossom thinning. Now, I don't want to push you to blossom thin if you've had a lot of damage, uh, but I hope you find blocks where there wasn't so much damage and we get this more widespread. And I'll, I'll add a comment about the blossom thinning, Terrence, that anybody you talk to in Washington says they, they couldn't get to the consistently high yields, which for them is 100 bins an acre, until they figured out how to blossom thin and now they can do it every year. I feel the same way. The problem with New York is what we're just living right now. Yeah, it's never easy. Climate change and early springs and chance of frost, cloudy weather, bees don't fly. It's just a more challenging climate at this time of year, but I hope we can do it all and be successful this year and gain confidence. Thank you very much, Terrence. Any other questions for Terrence? We're in an off year after heavy crop last year, any words about strategy for thinning? Well, there are some growers who had an on year last year. In general, the whole industry was a little bit off, but if you had a really on year last year and things are light in bloom, blossom thinning is not essential. And especially compound that with frost damage, I would skip blossom thinning on any block that is off and then just try to put a petal fall spray on and measure some fruits and that might be enough where you have an off year, a little bit of seven, maybe some NA and seven at petal fall would be enough. Yeah, folks, we are planning to have a, like we used to have in the field, the traditional petal fall thinning meeting with pest and disease updates from other Cornell scientists, um, crop update, labor updates. So we're putting that together kind of on the fly because we think, it's, as Terrence said, it's going to happen really quickly. So as soon as we get a date and things lined up based on phenology, Check the fruit facts, check your emails of our and on our website and we'll go from there. <music>